Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to introduce Blair Davy for from City University of New York. Uh, she will uh, talk on quantification of Yuzikovich projection theorem and its generalizations. And uh, the talk will be recorded and uh, the video will be posted on the YouTube channel uh, of CRM Center Research Mathematik. Uh, all right, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak here. And uh, so, yes, so I'm going to give a talk on um, the Besikovich projection theorem and um, generalizations of this theorem, as well as quantifications of this theorem and what that means. So I'm going to start by uh, talking about Hausdorff measure. And so, and um, because I'm going to eventually say some stuff about um, multi-scale analysis, I'm going to build a Hausdorff measure uh, through the Hausdorff content. So uh, Hausdorff content and measure and all right, so I'm going to take a set E contained in the plane, and uh, I'm going to take two radii, which are non-negative, um, one strictly bigger than the other. And then we define the what we call the restricted Hausdorff content as is the following quantity. So we've got H1, so it's the one-dimensional uh, restricted Hausdorff content of our subset E is defined as the infimum of the sum of the radii of balls, where the balls go over a collection script B, and the infimum ranges over um, all collections B that are countable uh, cover E and such that if B is in our collection, then the radius of B uh, falls into the, the range of R minus R plus. So we look at all covers by balls and we sum up the dimensions of all of the balls in those countable covers. And we call this the restricted Hausdorff content. And then we define the one dimensional Hausdorff measure Sorry. So the, the 1D Hausdorff measure is given by taking the limit as R plus goes to zero and setting R minus equal to, to zero. So H1 of E is the limit as so R plus goes to zero of H1 of R, sorry, zero. R plus of E. <clears throat> okay, so um, this is the measure that we will be working with. Um, we'll also work with the Lebesgue measure at times, and I'll just use absolute values to denote that measure. So we need to know about a uh, Hausdorff measure. We also need to know about uh, what it means for a set to be rectifiable or purely unrectifiable. And I'm going to give the dimension, uh, sorry, the definitions when we're looking at one dimensional sets contained in the plane. So if we take a set E contained in R2, uh, we say that it is one rectifiable. If uh, we can find a countable collection of Lipschitz functions, or I'm sorry, Lipschitz curves, so that when I look at the Hausdorff measure of E take away the images of all of these curves, then that remaining set has zero H1 measure. So in other words, the set is one rectifiable if it sort of up to blurring your eyes to that zero Hausdorff measure set, uh, it looks like a collection of Lipschitz curves. And conversely, we say that uh, 
E is purely one unrectifiable if for every Lipschitz curve when we look at uh, the measure of E intersected with the image of this map, then that set has measure zero. So it, it doesn't look at all like a Lipschitz curve anywhere. All right, so the Besikovich projection theorem is a result that sort of picks off for us uh, projection properties of sets based on whether they are rectifiable or purely unrectifiable. And going forward, because I am going to restrict to planar sets and one-dimensional Hausdorff measures, I'm going to stop putting the one in front of everything. So the Besikovich projection theorem. And uh, I'm going to give you the version that comes from Matilla's 1995 book. Um, there are plenty of analogous versions of this theorem, but this will be the one that I want to talk about later. So I'm going to take E, a subset of R2, and I'll assume that it has a finite positive Hausdorff measure. So H1 is between zero and infinity. And so there are two statements. So if so E is rectifiable if and only if when we look at um, so I take B to be some subset of E which I'll tell you about in a second and I look at the angular projection of B where this is just the the standard projection onto a line and I calculate the the one-dimensional Lebesgue measure of that set so that is positive for almost every angle, so for almost every theta in S1, whenever B is a, a subset of E with some positive measure. So it certainly holds if, if I put a, an E in the place of B there, but it also holds for every subset with non-zero measure and for almost every angle. So no matter which angle you choose, you project some little piece of E onto that angle, and for almost every choice of angle, you pick up something. On the other hand, uh, E is purely unrectifiable if and only if when we look at the projection onto angle theta of E, measure that in uh, one dimensional Lebesgue measure, this is equal to zero for almost every angle theta on the, on the circle. Okay, so there is this connection between rectifiability and purely unrectifiability and what happens when we take our set and project it onto angles. And so what I wanna, um, I'll first talk about the, the first part of this theorem. And, um, and so let me give you what I call the, the cartoon proof of the first part of the theorem. So let's suppose that um, so the idea behind A. So suppose that E is rectifiable. So we got E contained in R, which is rectifiable. Okay, so that means that E sort of up to a blurring of a set of H1 measure zero looks like a collection of Lipschitz curves. Okay, so E contains a piece of a Lipschitz curve. So I'll, I've got some curve contained inside of E. And um, if we zoom in to this curve, um, because it's Lipschitz, it has tangents almost everywhere. So I'll pick a point uh, where it looks like a tangent exists. So Here's my point, and then I'm going to zoom in. Okay, so I zoom in and sort of around that that particular point, uh, the curve looks like a little line segment. 
So if I look at this little zoomed in piece of my, my rectifiable set, it looks like a little line segment. So if I choose to project uh, onto sort of the direction of the tangent, or sorry, technically I'm projecting orthogonal to it, I pick up a point, which is a set of measure zero. But if I choose any other direction, project this way, then I pick up a little, a little interval, which has finite measure. So that is sort of the cartoon explanation for, for where that first part of the statement is coming from. So there's one angle where you're not going to see anything except a point which has a big measure zero, but everywhere else you'll pick up a little interval. And can you recover the like H1 measure of a curve from the projections, right? Yes. So I'll hopefully touch on that soon. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, okay, so I want to talk about part B of the Besicovich projection theorem. So these projections and what they have to do with unrectifiability. And so uh, to sort of verbally restate the, the theorem that part B of the theorem that I've just written down, uh, it says the Besicovich projection theorem asserts that if I take a subset E of the plane that has finite length in the sense of Hausdorff, and is purely unrectifiable, which means that its intersection with any Lipschitz graph has zero length, then almost every linear projection of E to a line will have zero measure. Okay, so um, I want to now take a, a more probabilistic look at what sort of a different viewpoint on, on this theorem. So um, I want to tell you about the Buffon needle problem. Okay, and this is a, a or the probabilistic Buffon needle problem. So I'm going to take a subset E of the unit square And the Buffon needle problem asks, what is the probability that uh, when I take this, so I've got a set, it's inside of a box. Um, I don't know, it looks like that. And we ask, what happens if I take a needle or a line and I drop it onto the box? So what does that mean? I don't know, I drop a line, I drop a line. Um, so what is the probability that when I drop a needle or a line at random onto the plane, and I know that it's intersecting the box, the, the unit square that contains E, what is the probability that this line intersects the set E? So we want to calculate this probability. So P is the probability that L intersects E where L is a line in R2 that intersects the unit square. So how likely are we to touch our set E with these needles that we randomly drop onto the unit square? So if we parameterize all such lines, uh, we're going to let L sub beta omega be a line, a line through say zero beta, uh, which is orthogonal to direction omega. And then we see that sort of once we calculate this probability, it's actually equal to the measure of the set of all beta omega in R cross S1, such that E intersects those lines. So we're looking for this, this measure of the lines, so we're going to parameterize the lines with respect to Y intercept and direction. So once we do that, it turns out it's, it's just proportional to calculating the measure of all such beta and omegas. 
And if I fix a direction omega, um, what does that set in this, this set associated with the probability look like? So I take my, my unit square. The E is the collection of, of blue points. And I'll, I'll fix the direction. So let's say my direction is this way. And so I'm looking for the collection of all lines that are orthogonal to omega that pass through some point inside of E. So all of those lines go through, all of those lines. These are supposed to be parallel lines, but they're not quite working out that way. Okay, now I'm gonna sort of connect them all up to the, to the y-axis. Okay, so um, what this picture is supposed to show is that if we fix omega and S1 is fixed, then if I look at the set of all beta in R such that uh, E intersects L beta omega, then that is the same thing as the projection onto angle omega of the set E. So calculating how many betas give me a line through angle omega that intersect my set E is the same thing as taking E and projecting it onto that angle omega. So if I uh, use this observation in combination with Hubini's theorem. Now we see that this, this probability, sorry, this probability uh -oh. There we go, sorry, my iPad got a little frozen there. Uh, whoa. So, uh, rather than integrating over both uh, beta and omega, I'm going to integrate over omega, the measure of this set beta and r, for which E intersects these lines. And uh, then integrate all of those with respect to omega. And this is the integral over S1 of the projections onto omega of my set E. And this is a quantity which is called the Fougart length. So what we see here is that the Fougart length tells us about the Buffon needle problem. And there's also a connection between the Fougard length and the Besicovitch projection theorem. So I'm going to describe this as a, as a corollary. So I'll take E contained in R2. We'll assume that the H1 measure of E is uh, positive and finite. And so sort of a, a rewording of the Besicovitch projection theorem now that we have this Fougard length in hand is that if E is rectifiable, then that implies that the Fougard length of E is strictly positive. So Vesikovic told us that if E is rectifiable, then for almost every angle, the projection onto the angle gives us a positive measure. So if we integrate a collection of positive quantities over the, the circle, then we will get a positive quantity. And on the other hand, if E is purely unrectifiable, which I'm going to start abbreviating as PU, then this tells us that the Favard length of E is zero. So we know that for almost every angle, the projection is equal to zero. So integrating all of them up, we would get zero as well. So these projections tell us about rectifiability. 
And what that means is if I take a rectifiable set and I drop a needle onto this set randomly, then there is some chance that that needle will, will touch the set E. But if I drop a needle onto a purely unrectifiable set, then almost surely it will not touch the set. Yeah. Can I ask a naive question? So you are dropping a one-dimensional needle, right? So suppose we start dropping 1.5 uh, Hausdorff dimensional needle on a set sort of, uh, can you imagine uh, Bizikovic projection and so on uh, for sets whose dimension is not one, and mm -hmm. then, so it's not so clear what should be the projection then, but intersecting with, so uh, one dimensional sets, there is a good supply of them and sort of lines are perfect. Uh, mm -hmm. But you could imagine having some collection of 1.5 dimensional sets and you would be intersecting with them and that would be sort of testing whether the set is 1.5 dimensional or not. Uh, yeah. Um, is, it, is it reasonable or is it like too naive? I'm not sure. <laughs> So I'm not sure, I, I, there are higher dimensional versions of the Besicovitch projection theorem, um, and I'm not sure if they are only integer value dimension. Mm -hmm. um, Crystal, my co-author, may know more about that if she's willing to. Hey, you want to check out something called the Marstrom projection theorem, which came about 20 years later. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so um, so we came along and we were like, why needles? Why are we dropping lines onto this set? There are lots of other one-dimensional objects that we could drop onto the set. And maybe there are lots of other one-dimensional objects that would give us the same sort of information. So we asked, can we drop curves? Can we replace these lines by curves and still pull out this information about rectifiability? from looking at um, the projections onto curves, whatever that means. So what if we replace lines by curves? So I like to, to think about, I don't know, take like a hoop earring and drop your hoop earring onto the, the unit uh, the unit square on the plane and ask, does the earring touch your set? And can you distinguish rectifiability based on that answer? And so in contrast to the lines where we're thinking about the lines as filling up a two-dimensional probability space by varying the angle and the y-intercept, now we're thinking about these curves as filling out a two-dimensional set by having a different center say within the, the unit cube or sorry, the unit square or something larger depending on how big the curve is. So let's let C denote a, a curve in the plane. And so we want to calculate the probability that C intersects E when it's dropped randomly onto the unit square. So if we mimic what we had before, we see that this probability is proportional to the measure of all points alpha beta in R2, such that E intersect alpha, sorry, alpha beta plus C. So I'm thinking of C as say fixed around the origin and then I'm shifting it to, to alpha beta. So alpha beta plus C intersect E is non-empty. So I want to measure all sort of centers where I'm going to, to intersect my set E. So observe that uh, E intersects this curve centered at alpha beta. If and only if uh, alpha beta is contained in the, I want to write it as a sum set, E plus minus C. So this probability is proportional to looking at the, the measure of the set E minus C. So um, in terms of language for, for some, 
measures of some sets is interesting. It's also connected to this problem. <clears throat> okay, so we saw sort of looking at the, the Buffon needle problem that these standard projections lead us to the Favard length, which gives us a, a way of determining information about rectifiability. So I wanna develop a, a so-called curve projection. So I'm gonna take uh, my curve C, I'm gonna fix the curve so that I can draw pictures. So I'm gonna let C for this, uh, the sake of the following pictures be the upper semicircle. Say unit, but it may not come out exactly looking like a unit circle when I draw it. But. So for uh, my fixed curve, I define a family of curve projections that go from uh, the plane to the power set of the reals. And they're given by the following. So P alpha of P is defined as the set of points in R for which alpha beta is in uh, P minus C. So it is the set of Y coordinates of the intersection of P minus C with the line X equals alpha. So if I take a point P and I put a upper semicircle around it, and then I look at x equals alpha, this line over here. This y coordinate is the, the projection. And then the inverse map, phi alpha inverse, goes from R to the power set of the plane and the alpha inverse of beta is equal to alpha beta plus C. So that means that if I take P, I project alpha, phi alpha of P, and then the pre-image will just be the curve that passes through both P and that, that intersection point alpha phi alpha P. So now we can use this language to, to look at the probability associated with the, let's say the Buffon curve problem. So that probability is then proportional to using my new language. It's the set of all alpha beta in the plane. So centers of curves that intersect our set. So this is the set of alpha beta such that E intersect phi alpha inverse of beta is non-zero. And if we fix alpha, then the set of all beta in R such that E intersect phi alpha inverse of beta is non-empty, this is exactly the curve projection of E. So if we follow the idea of, the, of what we saw before by rewriting the probability using Fubini's theorem, we get that this probability is the integral over, I'm sorry, it's proportional to the integral over R of the measure of all such beta. So fixing alpha and then integrating over alpha alpha, so the integral over R of the measure of this curve projection of our set E. And so this is how we're going to define the Favard curve length of our set E. I just have a question that might be, um, this is uh, Mike Wilson, I'm in Vermont, might be kind of dumb. So this is really like, sort of like morally the probability because you're not restricting the alpha beta to lie so like in the unit square. It's sort of a mm -hmm. You know, right, right. Okay, I just yeah, I've glossed over the details, but depending, it's sort of the, 
the projection only makes sense when the the intersection is non empty and there's a way to make it rigorous, but um, I won't entirely yeah. go into that. But thank you. Yeah. I mean, the infinite metro space was kind of uh, throwing me. Okay, yeah, so I'm make sure. That. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so um, we've got this generalized Favard length and it gives us. Um, a proportion or an upper bound on the probability associated with the Buffon curve problem. And so now we want to ask, uh, when do we kind of get that version of the corollary that we saw before for uh, Favard curve length in place of the classical Favard length? So for what kinds of curves? Do we get the following? So we take E contained in R2, purely unrectifiable with a finite positive Hausdorff measure. Then can we say that the Favard curve length of E is zero? Okay, so uh, Shimon and Taylor uh, investigated this question and they show that it holds true when C is a, a C2 curve with non-vanishing curvature. And so when we started thinking about this problem, we were always thinking about circles or halves of circles, semicircles. Um, but before I talk about the curves that do work, I want to give you an example to indicate um, what kind of curves probably won't work. Okay, so I'm going to look at my, my favorite one-dimensional set in the plane, which is purely unrectifiable, the Cantor four-corner set. So K is C cross C where C is the middle half Cantor set. And we can realize K as the intersection of Kn, where n goes from one to infinity. And I'll show you what each Kn looks like. Actually, we can start at zero, but third. Okay, so K zero is the unit square. And then K one is the four corners of the unit square, each having length one fourth. And then K2, we iterate. So in each of those four corners, uh, we do what we did to get from K0 to K1. And I probably can't draw this, but uh, well, something like this. So we end up with 16 little squares of side length, one over 16. And that just keeps going and going and going. And so at the end of this process, it's a weird statement to make, process doesn't, just goes on forever. Um, so K is what we call the four corner Cantor set. K has Finite, uh, non, sorry, finite positive Hausdorff measure, and it is purely unrectifiable. Okay, so now I'm going to consider a line segment going through K. So I'm going to let L be the line with slope 
one half that passes through the origin. So I'll parameterize it like this. Okay, and I'm gonna convince you that this line intersects every single KM. So if I draw the line through K0, there it is, there's L. So L intersects K0. And if I draw the line through K1, I see that L intersects K1. Sorry, this is not empty. L intersects K1. And it intersects it in the, in the bottom left-hand square. And so if I go over to K2, I know that it will intersect again it's going to intersect the bottom left hand square. And I can just repeat this argument forever. So for any n, and n, we'll see that L intersect Km is non empty. And actually, so what I've done is I've I've chosen, and so so this is so for any z in zero one squared, you see that z plus l intersect k n is non empty for all n as well. So if I shift my line up or down, then it just keeps going and going. So we will just keep intersecting Kn for any n. And so what that tells us is that the Favard curve length, where my curve is chosen to be this line segment of slope 1 half, this is at least one for every n. And so that tells us that the Favard curve length of k has to be at least one. Um, k is purely unrectifiable. This is a line. Um, we hope to be able to say that for all such curves, the, the Favard curve length would give us zero. And here we're bounded away from zero. So obviously, there are some curves that will not work. And so this example is uh, indicating that we need to impose some sort of curvature condition. So the, the straight line just is gonna fail for us because of this example. Um, I could probably cook up some other curves that would, would break the statement if I uh, say looked at fractal curves, for example. Okay, so before I talk about what exactly we do need from the curves. I want to just say a little bit about um, the proof of the original Vesikovich projection theorem. So um, I'm going to assume that E is a subset of R2 that is purely unrectifiable. And uh, I'm going to give a few definitions that are used in the proof. So we take an angle theta and S1. And it is called a condensation direction. Of the first kind. If we get the following picture. So I take a point X in my set E and I draw a line through E uh, pointing in the direction of theta. So this line is L theta of X. And then I'm going to put a 
a ball around it of radius rho. And when I look at um, what's happening along this line, we have infinitely many points along the line, no matter how small that row is chosen to be. So for, for every row positive, when I look at L theta of X intersected with the, the ball, uh, and I count to this, so the number in here is infinite. So infinitely many points along the line, we call that direction, um, a condensation direction of the first kind or that angle. And then we ne also need a condensation direction of the second kind. So the idea behind uh, the second kind is we're gonna not just restrict ourselves to the line, but we're gonna wiggle out a little bit. So let me give you the, the picture. So we've got our point, we put a, the line through the point, <clears throat> and then we sort of wiggle the line a little bit. So if this is L theta of x, L theta minus epsilon of x, L theta plus epsilon of x. This is x. We still draw a ball around it. And then we look at the sort of the measure of E that is trapped inside of what I will always refer to as the bow tie. So this little wedge around the point that is sufficiently small and sufficiently close to that fixed angle theta. Um, we say that theta is, all right, so we define the set T X rho epsilon M. So we say that theta belongs to the set T if there exists an R between zero and rho, an I containing theta, with I having measure less than epsilon, so that when we measure what's happening in E intersected with that little bow tie associated with X and I, then this is gonna be sort of proportionally large. And so then we say that basically we, we do this at all scales. And so it's saying if you have a lot inside of this bow tie at, at all appropriate scales, then it is a condensation direction of the second kind. So theta in S1 is a condensation direction of the second kind at x in E if theta belongs to the set T, which is defined as a triple intersection of these sets T, X, rho, epsilon, M. So this is a somewhat naturalization, natural generalization of the first kind. So the first kind is restricted to a line. Now we're sort of expanding the line into a wedge, uh, looking at the H1 measure instead of the counting measure. And, and what these uh, things are saying. Uh, yeah, sorry. Just, uh, sorry, uh, just, if you look at the uh, condensation direction of the first kind, uh, mm -hmm. uh, how does uh, the definition depend on the set E? Uh, uh, if you look at the intersection with the ball. Yeah. Oh. Intersected with E, sorry. I ah, with that. E, okay, okay. That, right, thank you. <laughs> uh -huh. um, because I was a little puzzled, <laughs> thanks. Thank you, thank you uh -huh. for catching that. Yeah, yeah, um, okay. Right, everything's in E. Um, okay. So any, any other questions? Um, did I goof anything else? All right, so these condensation directions, um, I guess as the name would indicate, it's telling you that your set is sort of condensed along the direction. All right, and then once we have that definition in mind, we say that X in E is a point of radiation 
of E if almost every theta in S1 are condensation directions. of E at X. So you pick a point X and you look at every angle and it looks like your set is going along all of the lines or these, these wedge abbreviations of lines at almost every direction. So it's a point of radiation because it looks like your set is sort of radiating out of the point. So it is a place where there is no tangent, actually, because a tangent is uh, something that sort of tells you the direction that the set is moving. Um, but here you have exactly the opposite. The set is sort of going everywhere all at once. So um, let me say a few things about the idea behind the Besicovich projection theorem. So the idea behind the proof. So E purely unrectifiable implies that projection onto theta of E equals zero for almost every theta in S1. Okay, so the first thing is um, Lebesgue's density theorem implies that if E is purely unrectifiable, then for almost every point of E, H1 almost every point of E is a Point of radiation. So these, these purely unrectifiable sets have tangents nowhere. All right, so with that, then we take an angle of theta in S1 to be a condensation direction. X in E for H1 almost every X in E. So we're, we're using Fubini's theorem and we are ignoring a set of measure zero um, in S1. So we're just flipping the, the order. And then I'm going to take L omega to be the line through zero. So that's using our notation from before. So it's the line through zero that is orthogonal to omega minus pi over two. Okay, and then I'm gonna decompose E into three sets, E0, E1, and E2. So E1 is the set of all points for which theta our theta that we've fixed above is a condensation direction of the first kind. So CDs of first kind, CDs of second kind, and this is the other, but it has measure zero. And now we're gonna analyze these three sets individually. So, um, so first E1, I'm sorry, E0 has measure zero and projections are contractions. So this tells us that when we project E0 onto our angle omega, then we get zero. Okay, so for E1, we have our set, which we'll assume is contained in the unit square. And the points that I've drawn here are the, um, the points in E1. So these are all condensation directions, uh, 
points associated to condensation directions of the first kind. So that means that if I look along this direction associated with omega, I'm going to have infinitely many points along each of those lines. And then, so that tells me that when I, and then I'm going to sort of project them all down onto here, and I'm interested in the size of this projection. And so um, for any m in n, uh, because I know that each of those lines contains infinitely many points, they contain at least m points. So that tells me that m times the measure of the projection of omega onto E1, measure of the projection of E1 onto the angle omega, has to be bounded by the H1 measure of E1, which is bounded by the H1 measure of E, which is finite. Um, so, but I can take m to be as large as I want. So that tells me that the projection onto omega of E1 has to be zero. So that's this little counting argument combined with a, what we call the a Fubini type uh, counting argument. And then E2 is, is similar and sort of to account for the fact that we're looking at wedges instead of um, single lines, you use the, the tally covering argument. Okay, so E0, E1, and E2 all have zero projection. So E has zero projection, and that is what needed to be shown. So the projection onto omega of E equals zero. Omega was almost every point on the unit circle. So that's the idea behind it. So um, basically the, the important tools here are these lines and the wedges. And so if we can extract these lines and wedges from the, the, the needle problem and pass them off into the curved problem, then the arguments go through. And so the, the lines are replaced by the curves and the wedges just become curved wedges. And as long as the tangents are always changing, then we don't end up getting degenerate curve wedges. So if uh, C has changing tangents, the curved wedges are non-degenerate. And the arguments can be generalized. So we get uh, the following theorem. So let's take C to be piecewise C1 of finite length. with a piecewise by Lipschitz derivative or uh, tangent vector derivative. So if E is purely unrectifiable with finite positive Hausdorff measure, then the Favard curve length of E vanishes. So under these conditions on the curve, uh, the Favard curve length gives us information about the, the purely unrectifiable nature of the underlying set. And um, so I'm very low on time, but um, just to touch on the other part of the, the title. So the generalization aspect of the title has to do with taking lines and replacing them with curves and when that is allowed. 
And then the quantification aspect is sort of how do we take this theorem and quantify it? And what does that mean? So the Favard curve length is a quantity. So that's fine. And so the idea behind it is what does it mean to quantify this notion of purely unrectifiable? So we have a theorem um, which says that if we have a set that is nearly purely unrectifiable, then its Favard curve length will be very small, as long as the curve satisfies the same set of conditions that we've outlined here in the qualitative version of the theorem. And so for that proof, we, we follow a paper of Terry Tao, who did it in the, in the straight line setting, and we use multi-scale analysis, uh, and that is, that is what happens. And so I will I'll end there. Thank you. Well, I would like to, uh, to thank David for a wonderful talk. Are there any questions? I have a, qu I have a question. There was um, um, uh, all that stuff reminded me of stuff I'd seen uh, some years ago with the, the so-called. There, there was a you know, Peter Peter Jones had a characterization of uh, a rectifiable um, of rectifiable sets involving the uh, what came to be called the Jones distance. You know, the, you, what you would draw. You would draw a line, and you would probably the, the um, there, there was a Carlson measure condition. I forgot the details. Has this come up at all in your uh, in your work with this? Uh, no, oh, but just but it. thank you because uh, yeah, yeah. now I can yeah, look into that. that. Was, um, yeah, it can't be called the jo the uh, the Jones distance. It was a way of quantifying the degree of non rectifiability of a set. Uh, the beta numbers. Hmm. The beta numbers. Yeah, it was a beta number. It was like you, 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 you would for every, you, you would basically do it like a Carlson decomposition of, of the set. You would draw, you would draw lines, and find basically the the max, the maximum distance between the set and the line, and then the nth over all possible lines going through going through that 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 little square, and then you would um, I think you would square that. I think you then multiply it by maybe the maybe the length of the square, and you add it up, and it had, if that was a Carlson measure. If that's not as bad a Carlson measure condition, then it was right, then it was rectifiable. Okay. Oh, the, 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 a rectifiable curve would pass through the set. That was it. Yes. It, it would satisfy the uh, this Jones. Uh, I'm not quite sure of Jones dimension. I'm not quite sure what, what he called it. It was, it was a long time Jones ago. Jones beta number? Yeah, the, 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 the beta number. It was, it was, he um he apologized when he gave the lecture because a grad student had made up the had made up the uh, the slides and so kept calling about the Jones measure, the Jones this, of course, which is just, you know, terribly gauche, name it after yourself. He, he didn't name it after himself, the grad student did. <laughs> yeah. So, um, um, yeah, so we use um, in our quantification of, uh, well, we're, we're more interested in the, the unrectifiability end of the spectrum. Yeah. Um, so we use this rectifiability constant that was introduced by Tao in, in the paper that, that we are generalizing, uh, which is uh, Proceedings of the London Math Society 2011, I think. Um, and so it's it's sort of this measure of you, you look at all orthonormal bases, you look at all Lipschitz curves, and you kind of build a like a little border around the Lipschitz curves, and then you project onto an interval that's substantially big, and you say sort of like how much of your set is in this bubble around all possible Lipschitz curves. And if that is very small, when you look at all possible variations, uh, then that is the, the rectifiability constant. So it's sort of looking at the low end um, when we close to being purely unrectifiable. Mm -hmm. um, and other notions I've seen are sort of more interested in when you're close to being rectifiable. So, um, but that, thank you. I'll, I'll look into that for sure. Great talk, thank you. Uh, can it be re related to the Fourier transform of the maybe characteristic function of your set? Because I think there may be some result about at least uh, like the rate of decay at infinity and things like that. But uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I don't remember exactly how to formulate it, but uh, just the 
again, naive question. I don't know. Um, so I think that uh, I I haven't done anything in that uh, direction, but I think Crystal looks at uh, some sets using Crystal. Are you still with us? <laughs> she uses this technique, and so she may be able, be able to to speak to that. Um, I I haven't thought about it in that way. Yeah. So. If you, if you want to think about um, some sets, for instance, so if you think about the, the set of points which are at distance one away from E in some sense, so that's that's if you, um, E plus S1 if you think of the Minkowski sum. So there you're taking the circle and you're putting um, a measure on it and then you can think about its Fourier transform. So if you want to know information about some sets, you can look at convolutions of measures, right? Because convolutions are are supported under some sets and then yes mm -hmm. comes up but but okay i'll stop talking <laughs> thank you we, we should definitely uh think more on on exploiting for you techniques though okay and i guess this uh, yeah. Does anyone else have any other questions? Uh, well, uh, if not, uh, let's uh, thank Blair again for the for the talk. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. <laughs> and uh, so I think the, the recording uh, will be on the CRM YouTube channel soon. I'll uh, put a link on the seminar page. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>